I want to address the fact that God has designed a reunification between the church of our day and the Jewish roots and perspective of 2,000 and longer ago. And that this is going to bring about multiple promises starting from the Old Testament and all the way through the New that will signal the culmination, the coming together of the end time kingdom and the final revival that will usher in the Lord's return. Amen? And my original title for this was uh, scrapped by wiser minds. And it was going to actually, I just told you that I'm going to, I'm going to, to uh, tie us into the Hebraic roots. But my original title was Hebraic Root Canal. <laughs> and I don't mean any disrespect, but there is, there is a lot going on in the church world today that I find inexplicable, almost, if I look at it strictly from a biblical, exegetical perspective. I go to answer the questions and I'm like, that's not even a question. How are they getting that? But I remember that this prophetic direction is there. God is wanting to bring back together the Jewish perspective into the church. I feel like that is God's desire. That is God's heart. That is even at the heart of our purpose for this time. And I think that Christians are picking up on that. And in effect, they're riding a godly wave, but in a wrong direction, if that makes sense. So the particulars, I don't know how deep we'll get into it, but I ask you to bear with me because in order to address a topic like this, I cannot get into the weeds of this as deeply as I truly would love to. You can, you can bring those questions up in a question and answer session. You can, you know, scratch through three pages as you write the notes while I'm going if you need to. You can text to the number that is on the handout. But I've got to kind of give a big picture. Because I think that if we see the big picture, then the small pieces start to find meaning not as standalone items, but in their interrelatedness. Amen? So I'm going to make some claims here at the front end, and then I'm going to seem to diverge from those claims, but I'm going to come back and finish and conclude with them at the end. So as the church divorces from her false Greek influences as she separates from the paganization uh, that we really heard about already in Brother Dan's teaching, she's going to be moving back to her roots in Judaism. And some of this, this is going to result th that we're going to see that Christ's salvation was the fulfillment of promises made to Abraham. That there is, no, there is no New Testament without the Old Testament. That there is no salvation or gospel apart from the Old Testament and the promises made to the fathers. We're going to see that being severed from her Jewish roots, the church has confused her view and relationship with God supplanting the Jewish view with a Neoplatonic view that turns God into a philosophical absolute instead of the one who came and took on flesh that we might know him intimately. We're going to see a restoration of faith as trust to walk, as trust to make an exodus out of one culture and into another. We're going to see returning to Jewish roots will signal the church's 
final revival. In a literal sense, it will bring about what Paul called life from the dead. We're going to see that it will that only the restored corporate kingdom will that, that to return to a Jewish perspective is to is to give up the radical individualism and begin to perceive salvation and the whole as a kingdom as a corporate project that is a Jewish perspective. Um, we're going to see that the kingdom's atomization starts and ends with Greek analytical knowledge. But it doesn't just atomize our thinking and our doctrines, it atomizes us from each other. The Jewish view restores our view and relationship with God, restores our purpose behind suffering, and uh, signals a restored unity between leaders and power and joy and praise in the worship of David's tabernacle. Those are ten points that this shift is supposed to signal. This is an exciting shift in the church. But I'm going to not bury my lead. It does not signal a return to the Levitical system or the law. Sorry. Um, If you have rotten tomatoes, the kitchen can incorporate those into the compost system that we have worked out with our chickens. Please don't throw them in here. No food allowed in here. You thought that was to keep God's house clean, but it's to keep me safe. (laughs) Amen. So let me just say that I can't give as much content in one hour as I would like to give. So you're going to have to go back and listen to the teaching from last conference, I think it was, when I talked about political kingdom or brotherhood society. But suffice it to say, I argued in that teaching that the central pivot and conflict while Christ was on the earth before his death was a question about what kind of kingdom. Everybody was united in that they expected a kingdom. But the division was in what kind of kingdom. And this unified this confusion unified the pharisees and the disciples of jesus they both thought that he was going to bring a practical davidic dynasty a political kingdom to solve their roman occupation problem does that make sense but in fact he was coming to bring a spiritual kingdom i'm summarizing that teaching go back and watch it if you want to or listen better to listen than to watch trust me But he was coming to bring a kingdom that was spiritual. And this obviously pivots on his conversation with Nicodemus. But some central scriptures that that speak to us about what kind of kingdom Jesus was coming to bring can be found in John 3, in, um, in, in Matthew 11, in Mark 9, 1, and of course in Acts 1. But... In Mark 9, he tells them, most assuredly, you won't die until you see the kingdom of God come with power. So that's, you can't get around that. That's an absolute statement. Those disciples did not die until they saw the kingdom come. So whatever the kingdom is, it was extant on the earth before they died. I'm sorry, millennial, um, you know, post-millennial, premillennialists. That's what he said. And then the next one is in Matthew 11. He says to them, If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And I would make this the seminal kingdom definition because it suggests that Jesus saw the kingdom not in terms of the vassal uh, empires like Rome or whichever empire you name, but he saw the power of death as the big kingdom and the power of life as the big kingdom. And there's only really two kingdoms, the power of God and of life and the power of death and the devil. Of course, Hebrews 2.14 bears that out when it says that the devil holds people in bondage all their lifetime through the fear of death. So when Jesus says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He's saying that His kingdom was in effect to bring spiritual power against spiritual power. 
to bring a spiritual victory and liberation from spiritual bondage. And this is borne out by the fact that his weapons are not carnal but mighty through God. Of course, we see that in Acts 1, they ask Jesus, just before he ascends, they say, is it at this time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says, it's not for you to know, but go to Pentecost and wait there and what you're looking for is going to happen. That's my paraphrase. Pentecost is the seminal power event that shows the birth of the kingdom. And I do say birth. I don't say maturation. I say birth of the kingdom. Amen. But that's Pentecost answered their kingdom quest. Okay. The kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. The power was the power of the Holy Ghost. This is seen when he sends out the 70 and he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, right? This is a kingdom picture. This is a a, a notion of Satan in in a position of power enthroned. And all of a sudden, as the people of God begin to move in the gifts of the spirit, the devil comes down so fast it looks like grease lightning. Okay, so that is a summation of my kingdom talk from last year. Go back and look at it, but everything that... I mean, listen to it, but everything that I'm saying here today is built on that. Capiche? Okay. So, even still, the, the kingdom came, at, the kingdom was born at Pentecost. And the kingdom consists of overcoming the devil's spiritual power with God's spiritual power. Is that real simple? I can't hear you. Because I don't know how to make it simpler. He's bad, God's good, God gets him and beats him. I mean, I don't know how to make it simpler. (laughs) That's the kingdom. The power to overcome the, the power of the evil one. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? This is inaugurated at Pentecost. But it's not yet fully manifest fully revealed. There's more that's supposed to happen even in the world than what had happened at Pentecost. Pentecost is the birth. Amen? The first church saw the complete revelation. There's no revelation that's going to be added to the first church that's not from the devil. Amen? That's our our contention. But It saw the complete revelation. It saw the complete pattern. It saw the the reality of God's power. But there was an extent of built out manifestation that they still anticipated in the first church. That's what we got to look at today. And this is Acts 3 that we're going to look at. In Acts 3, Peter is giving what is called his second sermon And he says, now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced before him by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Can everybody say fulfilled? Fulfilled. So something's done. Something's complete. Something's done. But something's still coming. He has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return So that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you. He says, I want you to repent. I want you to get on with this so that Jesus can return. So that he can send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. So Peter is standing here in the book of Acts era, in the outpouring era, in the miracle working era because he's answering the miracle at the gate beautiful. That's how he starts preaching this one. And he's saying that Jesus is going to stay in heaven until something is restored on earth and whatever this was he says it was spoken of by the prophets it was anticipated so this is what i'm talking about when peter is standing in the new church he's standing in the first century church saying there's still a promise 
awaiting for us. And that is that full extent of what was predicted by the prophets. He begins to quote them. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from the brethren, from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. So he's saying you need to repent because something needs to happen through that repentance that is going to bring the Lord's return. And in short, he's talking to the Jews, to the Jewish people. He's not speaking to them as a Christian. He's speaking to them as a Jew to Jews. The concept of Christian as separate from Jews does not exist. And it doesn't exist for more than a decade. And it really only gets formulated and clarified about a century later. But they saw themselves as heirs of the Old Testament promises. They did not see themselves as separate. Amen. Jesus has already said in Matthew uh, 17, 11, Elijah does indeed come and he will restore all things. Jesus has already said that, that the repentance, I don't know what translation they're always going to be using up there, but thank them for sticking up with me. Um, Jesus has already said that Elijah, which is the ministry of repentance, is going to restore all things. Now Peter is telling them, you guys have got to come to repentance because when you repent... We're going to see a restoration. And when the restoration comes, the Lord's going to return. Does this make you think of any other scriptures? Like that he is the foundation stone. He is the cornerstone. But he is also the what? The capstone. And, and, and what, is, what does that make you think of? That Paul said that he must reign until he brings all things into subjection under his feet. Amen. So... The church has got to come to a certain level of maturity. The kingdom has got to reach that which was promised in the Old Testament. And when it does, the Lord's going to return. And this is directly addressed to the Jewish people that when you guys come back, we're going to see this restoration. And when this restoration happens, Jesus is going to come back. Does this make sense to you? Now, Peter didn't know the times and the seasons because no man knows it. I think it's quite possible he anticipated this could have been next year. He had just seen Jesus go up into heaven. He might have thought it was that coming Sabbath or that or the following uh, Pesach. I don't know, but we don't know when he thought. But he didn't. I doubt he thought it was going to be two thousand years. But the promise still awaits. The promise of what he is talking about it stays in the mind of God. It's still on the calendar. Something's still got to happen. It's going to be accelerated by the return of the Jewishness to the church and the building out of the kingdom that was promised by the prophets. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's look at this kingdom a little bit as it was predicted. In Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, it says, In the last days the mountain... Now notice it says in the last days. Can everybody say last days? Last days. Last days. Not... Not, not in the middle, but in the end. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house, the mountain of the Lord's temple or house will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, first of all, let's notice that it says all nations. That's anticipating a, an inter-ethnic uh, congregation. It, that is anticipating a time where it's not just Israel, but it's all the people of the earth. This is Isaiah. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. Notice it says it's the temple of the God of Jacob. So it's, there's an Israelness to it. There's a Jacobness to it, right? It's an identifying statement there. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths The law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and they shall bear the, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. This is anticipating the end of violence in the church and the coming of the kingdom of peace where the Christians are no longer going to be taking up the sword. 
They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Maybe it's going to be an agricultural dynamic. I don't know about that. Nations shall... I actually do, but I'm going to wait. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isaiah 9, 6 is the messianic prophecy, and I'm, I'm unfortunate that I'm having to read from the ESV, but hopefully they're putting something better up there. Uh, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Government, government, government. This does, con- this does uh, suggest that this is a kingdom. This is not just a blessing that Jesus is coming to bring all these individuals. He's actually coming to organize a kingdom like a king. Government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government peace. There will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. Isaiah 11, verse 1 through 16, he says here that there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And this again is speaking of a a kingdom that has global influence across the whole world. Isaiah 16, then a throne, Isaiah 16, 5, then a throne will be established in steadfast love. And on it will sit in faithfulness the tent of David, who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. So here we have a throne... But it's established in unfailing love. (laughs) And it's going to be this throne, this rule of God on the earth, is going to be emanating from the tabernacle of David. That takes us to Acts 15, where they're talking about how to bring the Gentiles into the covenant of promise, right? And what does he say? James says in Acts 15, is it 15... 15 through 17, James says to them that this process of bringing the Gentiles into the church is what was promised by the prophets when they said that David's tabernacle was going to get restored. We would love to go into that teaching, um, but go watch the prayer and praise seminar. Or I'm sorry, listen to it. Um, The prayer and praise seminar. And it'll bless you, I promise you. But In short, David's tabernacle is a precedent because it's the first time people have access to the presence of God on a brand new level. In his tabernacle, there was no veil keeping people from the presence of God at the ark. In his tabernacle, everybody was allowed to come in and worship. And it was the first time that Gentiles, 70 Gentiles from the house of Obed-Edom were in there worshiping God and dancing and singing and making music all, all the time. So his tabernacle, this tabernacle of access to God's presence was the first antecedent, the first precedent of how God was going to bring Gentiles and Jews together in a beautiful experience of praise and unity in the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. If you don't get excited about this, there's food over there waiting for you, but this is incredible stuff. So this is fulfilling the Isaiah 16 passage where it said that the throne, that God's throne will be established in steadfast love and it will come from the tent of David. Everybody still with me? In in Isaiah 65, 25, it says that the wolf and the lamb shall graze there. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Poor lion. And dust shall be the serpent's food. Good on you. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. It doesn't mean there's not going to be problems elsewhere, but in his holy mountain, there's going to be an end to violence. In his holy mountain, people who behave like serpents, well, they're still going to get dust. But people who were once lions in their nature are going to turn into people who are more like lambs in their nature. It's a spiritual metaphor of what's happening in the church. In Ezekiel 37, it says, my servant David shall be king. And I apologize to the translators. My servant David shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. 
They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince. Same thing in, in Daniel 7.27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole ev- heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Amen? Zechariah 14, Micah 4. I know I've got to keep skipping here, but Ephesians 1, 9. Let's get to that one. Paul says, And He has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ as a plan for the fullness of times to bring all things in heaven and on earth together in Christ. So what I'm saying, and I'm having to go fast, but you can follow follow with me, is that Peter stood at the birth of the kingdom, but anticipated a fuller expression of it in the end times. Amen? And he told the Jews, when you come to God, when you accept Jesus, we're going to see this restoration. And when we see this restoration, we're going to see Jesus return. Hallelujah? So we got to figure out how to get out of Greece. And get back into Jerusalem. (laughs) We got to figure out how to get out of Babylon and get back into Jerusalem. And we got to figure out how to receive whatever was lost of that Abrahamic faith. Because that's what's going to bring the restoration that brings the Lord's return. Amen? And this is what Paul's saying when he says in the end he's going to bring all things together in Christ. The promised kingdom can't be completed until the Jews return with a vision of what God originally promised to the prophets. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Let's look at the kingdom a little bit more. What does this kingdom look like? How many of you feel like you're part of the kingdom of God? Okay, perfect. Praise God. I'm sorry for the rest of you. Um, (laughs) If I asked you, Daniel, if I said, Daniel, describe to me the state of Texas, you could do it, right? I mean... It would be hard because it's so wonderful. But you could do it. (laughs) Especially if you were talking to someone like Micah Bowden who likes to bash it, right? I mean, he's not here, but you know. Oh, wait a minute. (laughs) I saw you back there. Um, If I said, describe to me the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, David, you could do it. I mean, maybe somebody could. You could describe to me this kingdom, right? If I said, describe to me the United States of America. Okay, it would take books, it would take libraries to do it completely, but you could do it in a sentence or two, right? But what if I said, describe to me the kingdom of God? If you don't know the answer to that question, you can't really become part of it as God intended. If I don't have an idea, a vision, an image in my mind of what we're after, I'm not going to be advancing this kingdom. You know, there's a saying that says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And if we don't know what that kingdom is, what it looks like, any road will take us there. But we're actually not getting there at all. We're just, we're just in the malaise of our confusion. Peter had something in mind. He knew what the prophets had foretold. And he knew that these people of Israel were essential to that restoration that would bring about the Lord's return. We need to have that in our minds as well. So let's make that our first real objective here. And I'm, we're going to do a test afterwards to make sure everybody got it. I'm not saying when afterwards. but um, How do you describe the kingdom? We know that it has a distinct kind of power. And that all the, all the awful things that have been done in the name of the kingdom were done because they didn't understand that the swords should be beat into plowshares and that they would learn war no more. Amen. That they would never fight in his holy mountain again. So we have to identify what is the central power of this kingdom. What is it, brothers and sisters? Love. God is love. And perfect love casts out the power of the devil by which he reigns, holding people in bondage all their lifetime, right? So the power 
To say that it is the kingdom of power is not enough. We have to define what kind of power. It's the kingdom of love. The kingdom of the son of his love. Hallelujah. Okay, so that solves a lot of problems right there. Now that we have set aside worldly weapons, these are all other seminars, but you've got to float with me for a minute. Now that we have set aside worldly weapons, now that we have given up worldly politics, now that we have accepted with Jesus what he said to Pilate when, when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would take up swords and fight, but my kingdom is from another place. Okay? So it's not of this world. It doesn't use the weapons of this world. It doesn't use the politics of this world. It's not, that's a different kind of power altogether. Okay, now what is it? We all come to a conference like this kind of hoping, God, we want your kingdom to come. Don't we pray that every day? Your kingdom come, Jesus said. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The very first prayer, the very first petition that Jesus put was a begging that God would bring his kingdom that is a spiritual reality in heaven and is supposed to become a spiritual reality on earth. So what does it look like? What does that kingdom look like? Okay, let me ask you this. Have we seen its fullness? Are we living in the fullness of what is promised? Some are saying no. Everybody I can see is saying no, and the rest are being still because they don't want to answer. But have we seen its, what's promised? Okay, then what's missing? What's missing? Honestly, what, what is missing? Brother, Brother Zach says oneness, righteousness. He says right relatedness. Anybody else? What's missing? Love. Somebody said love. Joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Unity. These are hallmarks of the kingdom, I presume? Okay. Somebody, if you dare, somebody stand up and envision for us in a sentence or two what the kingdom would look like if it came true as you imagine it to be. Anybody? <laughs> Go ahead. Amen. So... It's his people working together in one full body. Brother, Brother Zach. The uninterrupted presence of God. Uh, Amen. Absolutely no dissonance in life. Things in heaven, things in earth, completely made into one. And so there's nothing that grieves God's spirit. We're never separated from his presence. Give him a mic. If you're going to go on like that, you're going to have to have a mic. <laughs> you said click. Here's good. Do I repeat what I just no, said? No, 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 no. Okay, yeah. so you said the uninterrupted presence of God, which is in short, oneness. Amen. Oneness, so that what we do, what we say, what we think, our whole of life. Okay, but that, that doesn't include our jobs, does it? If it doesn't include our jobs, then we're moving into pluralism and plurality again, and we're giving power to the gods that we were free from in Egypt's exodus. So... What does it include? What, what, what does it exclude? Let's ask that. It can't exclude anything. So if, if, we take the, 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 if we take that the Israelites are delivered from the false gods of Egypt, led out of slavery, they're brought into the only context in which monotheism can be true. God's sovereignty is there in things visible and things invisible as a people are living in right relationship to God, right relationship to one another, and right relationship to all creation. They're okay. even in right relationship to the world, finally. Amen. Okay, somebody, let's get some scriptures. Who wants to read some scriptures? Okay, somebody get me Psalms 110 and 1. Who, who can do that for me? The, uh, Brother Gabe's got it. Isaiah 9, 6, we already read that, but somebody can quote it for me. Everlasting Father. Okay, Matthew twenty two forty four. Who wants to get me that? Okay, Brother Rowan, I'm going to give that to you just to sprinkle it around the room. Hebrews 2, 7 and 9. 7 through 9. Sure. Hebrews 2, 7 through 9. Who's raising your hand back there? Is that you, Jez? Hi, Jez. Um, Acts 2, 32 through 36. Jez. 
Okay, who's going to get me 1 Corinthians 15, 25? Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Colossians 1, 18. Who's going to get that? Okay, Colossians 1, 18. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. Who's got that? Somebody with a loud voice. Do you have a loud voice? Okay, this one's got a loud voice for that one. Okay. All right, let's start with these scriptures. And listen, please stand when you read uh, and, and, and let the audience hear your voice. Whoever speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Psalms 110 and 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And we know that Jesus and Peter said this was referring to Jesus. So he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And it's getting hot in here. Do you all feel that? Or is it just me? I mean... I'm going to melt up here. I'm under a clock because I'm going to be melted by the time we're done. What does it mean to have one's enemies brought under one's footstool? Victory, that is the sign of subjugation. That is the sign of conquest. When the enemies would kneel at the footstool of a conquering king. So Jesus is going to have an agency of authority on the earth that we call reign. Not like sprinkling, but rain. And that agency of authority is going to be active until everything is brought under dominion to his feet. If there's one body and its head is in heaven, who are the feet on the earth? That's us, guys. We're the lowly feet. That's what is symbolized in the washing of the feet and so on and so forth. There's one body, like a veritable elevator shaft, and the head is in heaven, and the feet are firmly planted upon the earth. But we are waiting until everything be brought under subjection to his feet. That is to say, to his church, his body here on earth. Okay, the next scripture is Isaiah 9, 6. Did somebody get that one? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and it says, over the throne of his, uh, uh, his father David to rule and establish it forever. Okay, Matthew twenty two forty four. Who's got that? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is again Jesus emphasizing the same thing. Hebrews 2, 7 through 9. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Do not see, do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Okay, so this one says, When God subjected all things to Jesus, he left nothing outside his control. That's, is that what this one says? When God subjected all things to him, that is to Jesus, can everybody say, he left nothing outside his control? That's how all-encompassing the kingdom has got to be. He left nothing outside his control. Next sentence. Yet at present... We do not see everything subjected to him. So here is the tension. God's will is that everything be brought under the control of Christ. But there's a process because at present, as if to say we're trying to get out of the present, he says we do not see everything under him. There's our task, brothers and sisters, to bring everything under subjection to his feet. Next scripture. Let's go to Acts 2, 32 through 36 from the Jezreel Valley. Oh, I can't hear you, brother. This Jesus, which God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which we now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies work. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who's supposed to know this most assuredly? Let all the what? 
house of Israel. And here's the same scripture. Do you think this might be a theme? I mean, we have been on the same quoted passage now five times. 1 Corinthians 5.25. 15.25. I was just teasing. Accept it. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Hallelujah. Same thought, isn't it? Now we're on the sixth scripture. Let's look at Colossians uh, 1 18, somebody. So it says here that he is the head of the body with an object in mind. So that he will come to have first place in everything. So we can say that the instrument of the body is to bring all things under subjection to his feet. That's why he's the head of the body. So that in all things he will come to have first place. And when he has first place, when our relationships our vocation, our education, our witness to the world, everything about our lives gives him first place and becomes an expression of his will and authority, we can say that the kingdom is coming. On a microscopic level, on an on a, on a, on a, on a infinitesimal infant level, or on a global level, that's the kingdom. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, who has that? Amen. So here he says that God put everything under Jesus' feet and made Jesus to be head over everything. And the Amplified says this is a headship exercised in and through the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who filled all, filled all in all. Hallelujah. So the kingdom is this. The kingdom equals the power of Satan vanquished by the power of the Spirit. Christ's headship ordering relationships, familial, church, with the world and the state. All the treasures of the Gentiles brought to Zion. All things brought under subjection to his feet through the church. Essentials of life like education, economy, practical necessities, things in heaven and things on earth. An archipelago of whole life communities networking as a global messianic nation worldwide. That's the kingdom. Do you understand? It's when everything in a believer's life shows who their king is and what his will is. Jesus' prayer has a powerful suggestion in it. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where whosoever, whosoever's, who. Whoever's will is done in our life, that's whose kingdom is real in our life. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so I started by saying that the restoration of this kingdom is going to be accelerated by the return to a Jewish perspective, by a return to the Jewish roots. Now, we know that there are two roots in Judaism, one that is good and one that is bad. Okay, scholars will often tell us that the fig tree is symbolic of religious Judaism. You've probably heard that. You can see this in, in uh, Jesus' comment where he says, Consider the fig tree when it is green in the leaf. You know that summer has come. He's saying, look at Israel. When it comes back to be a nation, you know that the tribulation is not far off. Translated. Okay, but we also see this in his cleansing of the temple. Okay? So when Jesus goes to cleanse the temple, he encounters a fig tree on his way. And 
We need to understand the spiritual messaging that is coming to us through this highly metaphorical event. Jesus is not mad at a piece of wood because it didn't have a fig out of season. That, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that interpretation. But instead, he encounters this tree that was told to bear fruit and did not bear fruit. And he says, no more will anyone eat fruit from you again forever. And then he walks into the temple and he starts cleansing the temple. And when he cleanses the temple, they say, by what authority do you do these things? And he asks them about a tree that was told to bear fruit and didn't. Do you think there's a connection? When he says, the baptism of John, was it of God or was it of man? Now, why is he asking about this? Because when these same Pharisees went to be baptized by John, he told them, go bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Now do you see the link between this and the fig tree? And so he's basically encountering the fact that there is no fruit evidenced by the fact that they don't recognize God's authority in his cleansing behavior. That's proof to him that there's no fruit of repentance. So he says, um, <clears throat> the baptism of John, was it of God or was it of man? Basically what he's asking is what you reached for, why didn't you get it? If it was of God, you should have started a process that should be complete by now. But go ahead and tell me it wasn't of God and let's see how the people think of that. They say, we, won't, we, don't want you, we, we don't know whether it was of God or man. He says, well, neither will I tell you, suggesting he doesn't believe that they don't know, but that they are unwilling to say, right? And, 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 and the next day, they come back and, and, uh, and Peter says, Lord, look, the tree which thou hast withered yesterday is today already withered. And Jesus doesn't say, I know, it's sad. He says, have faith in God and you'll be able to do more than this. But you will also say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and it will obey you. So he's, he's telling this whole scene is, is, is the rejection of a religious system that is no longer able to recognize God coming in the direct anointing of human flesh. Do you understand? They couldn't receive God in the flesh, which is what Jesus was. And so... This system has taken the place of God. And about this system, it is said, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. Can we all agree that we don't want to get tapped into that root? That is a root that does symbolize a certain kind of Judaism that we do not want to be grafted into. But then there is another kind of Judaism where Paul says, do not boast against the root. For you do not support the root, but the root supports you. But Paul calls this not the fig tree, but the olive tree. And the olive tree metaphor comes from Zechariah. And it denotes fresh anointing. It denotes a flow of anointing Holy Spirit in the life of the tree. So there is a kind of Judaism, there is a kind of religious Judaism that is fruitless and cursed forever. Don't get tapped into that. And there is a kind of Judaism that has life flowing through it. And that is the Abrahamic faith and the sons of fresh anointing whose spirit is ministering to the whole earth. Hallelujah. And that's the root we want to get grafted into. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Richard Longenecker, who is a, his, a Christian historian, historian of, Christ, of Christianity, he says that, and I'm quoting, the first Christians were all Jewish. They knew themselves to be the people of God and to be in continuity with Israel. When, when they encountered the risen Christ, they drew upon a conceptual frame of reference and whose expressions were rooted in Semitic thought generally and Judaism particularly. But of the three early theological traditions, I'm still quoting, he says, of the three early theological traditions, the Greek, the Latin, and the Hebrew, Hebrew Christianity disappeared completely. 
He says there were three branches at the beginning. And the one that completely disappeared was the original one. It was Hebrew Christianity. Hebrew Christianity disappeared completely. Yet Hebrew Christianity was the original and most ancient branch. Reed notes that the influence of Hellenism and an anti-Semitic spirit present from before Nicaea through the Christological controversies of the 5th century contributed to the Hebrew Christianity's disappearance. Amen. So Reed and Longenecker are both saying that Christianity was severed from its root and it got supplanted by these other versions, namely the Greek and Latin view. Do you need to stand on your head and do jumping jacks? Because I know jumping jacks are hard, but doing them on your head is even harder. <laughs> are you still awake? Yeah. Don't go to sleep when we're just about to get controversial. <laughs> you got to get mad at me or I don't feel like I've done my job. <laughs> We've got to get back to the root. We've got to get back to the root. We can't, we can't get back to the root of the fig tree. We need to get back to the root of the olive tree. We need to get back to that experiential flow of direct relationship with God. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> so when did I start? Uh, no, that couldn't be. Uh, that, definitely not 5 to 11. His, his statement is not trustworthy, gentlemen and ladies. It was not, bef- it, was af- it was 11 or after. They weren't here on time. Be rational, man. He says they're holding lunch. Well, if, if I can work together with everybody's hunger, I think we can c- complete this. I want to I go into this just a little bit, but I'm going to have to abbreviate. Can, can you bear with me a little bit here? Yes. Josiah, I'd like to stop, but you know, I'd like to stop 12 minutes early, let the re- record reflect, but... <clears throat> Okay, I'll keep going. (laughs) You know, part of the confusion today is a confusion of terms. A term like the law, Torah, it has so many variegated meanings from Old to New Testament that we can be duplicitous in our usage of it, if that's fair. In short, we have to let the spirit and wise parsing of scripture discern what is being referred to in which place. So let me give you an example. Somebody says, what is the law? Well, Torah literally can mean teaching. It can mean instruction. It certainly can refer to the Mount Sinai Levitical system, but not exclusively. In fact, Jesus quoted Psalms and called that the Torah. So it is, it is disingenuous to assume that every time the term law refers to something good, it is referring to the Sinai covenant of Leviticus. And every time it refers to something bad, it is referring to some add-on that the Pharisees or the Midrash added to the picture. That's, that's just not fair. It's not that simple. If you, <clears throat> if you look in the New Testament, we don't, we don't only have the law. The law can refer to the whole Bible. It can refer to uh, what, what our consciences teach us is inherently God's, God's way. It can refer to Leviticus. It can refer to the Sinai Covenant but it can also refer to the law of Christ, what is called the law of Christ, or the law of the Spirit, or the perfect law of liberty, or the law of love. (laughs) Do you understand? So to simply, in our view, if somebody says the law, that's not generally synonymous with the teaching. But that word was synonymous in their time with simply saying God's teaching. God's way. Amen? 
Sometimes they are using it to refer explicitly and strictly to the Levitical system. Other times they're using it more broadly. That's the confusion. Everybody follow me there? So <clears throat> we can see examples in Scripture where Paul says the Gentiles who know not the law do the deeds of the law and are themselves a law unto themselves. They become a law unto themselves. Is he saying that they kept the exact regiments of the Sabbath and of circumcision? Highly unlikely. There's certainly no historical evidence of that. So what law are they keeping? They're keeping the law that was in nature, the law of God, the law of nature that was extant in the world and recognized by Plato and Abimelech. How did Abimelech know that his behavior was wrong? Moses had not said, thou shalt not commit adultery. How did he know it was wrong? Because you know, <laughs> you just somehow know. <laughs> Plato, Aristotle said, we, we come to the law by cobbling together what is most expedient from our experiences. And we work from particulars to the universal of absolutes. Plato said, no, we don't know who casts the shadow, but the shadow is cast and the law of God is in the world. It's extant. It's there. He thought that because he couldn't relate to God, God was not relatable, but that was just his problem, not everybody else's. But I digress. Do you get what I'm saying? So the Gentiles can participate in some sense in the law and yet not be practicing the Levitical system. Well, why was the Levitical system given? What was its point? Well, we're told that, that the Old Covenant was sent as types and shadows and arrows pointing toward a greater fulfillment. In short, the entire Old Covenant system was a metaphor of the spiritual realities that were to come. And were those spiritual realities, once something is made spiritual, it becomes less real, correct? Isn't that what the Bible teaches us? That this is real, but this, not so much. Does the Bible teach us that when something becomes spiritual, it becomes less real? Give me some examples. What about Jesus in John 6? When he says, the manna you ate from, heaven, from, from your fathers, that was not manna from heaven. But I am the true bread that comes down out of heaven. Was he saying that he was kind of a loaf of bread? you know, Or was he saying that the true bread was his life, his truth, right? So you would say that he is spiritual bread, wouldn't you? But he said that was more real than the natural. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And Paul said that God works by first the natural and then the spiritual. What's another example? Somebody give me another example from Paul. Paul says we don't look at the things that are seen because they're temporal. They're passing away. But he says it's what's unseen that is enduring and remains forever. So it is a complete figment, kind of like a fig newton, for Christians to act like it is more real to live in the flesh in the law than to figure out what these shadows were outlining in the spirit. Does that make sense? Now, I, I'm going to have I, to, 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 be, to be on Josiah's good side. I'm having to go quick here, but you get the point. What was the goal of the commandment? Why did God give the Levitical system? I've already said that he gave it to outline and to cast a metaphor of what was to come. What else was the purpose of the law? Well, Paul says that love was the purpose of the commandment, but what was the purpose of Leviticus? Okay, we got, we got, it was added because of transgression. And who said something over here? Keep them within God's reach. Keep them within God's reach. It was a corral. So, so here we have added because of transgression and shut up under the law because it's a pin. Okay, what else? Somebody else. Lead us to Christ. Lead us to Christ. Okay, it's, it's starting us in the right direction. Somebody else. Huh? Pedagogos, which is corral. Uh, pen us in, schoolmaster to lead us to Christ? Yes. That's right. 
It was to show us our sinfulness. Yes, sir. Life. Amen. The ultimate goal was life. The ultimate end was life. Amen. So the purpose of the law was to reveal sin. The purpose of the law was not to empower us to overcome sin, but to create the need in our consciousness that Christ could come and fulfill. Fulfill. Do you understand? That was why he said it. And it was all of these things and more. But that was its point. And what is the fulfillment of the law? As Brother Dan has already said. Paul says what the law could not do, weak as it was, through the flesh. So the medium of the law was what? Flesh. And so it was going to remain powerless. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did by sending His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Amen? So what does it mean when Paul says that if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live? And what does it mean in the same chapter where he says um, that the Spirit is working in us to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law? First of all, does he say that the Spirit is working inside of us to fulfill the Levitical system? Does he even say the Spirit is working inside of us to do all the works of the law? Is that what he says? Or does he say that the Spirit is working inside of us to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law? Hmm? So what is the righteous requirement of the law? What, in short, fulfills it? What does it? That's where all of these scriptures come into play from Jesus to Paul where he says love is the end of the law. Basically, the essence of human captivity is revealed in their inability to love sincerely. And the essence of human redemption is revealed in their ability to love as he has loved us. So the righteous requirement of the law is love. This alone sums up all the law and all the prophets. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. See, we're going through some thick stuff and nobody's going to sleep on me. Thank you, Jesus. So when it says that Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, What does that mean if we now know what fulfilling the law is? It says it means that Jesus came to fully manifest God's love to us. (laughs) Now, the law was not only something good, was it? It became something bad, didn't it? In what sense did the law become something bad? Does the Bible suggest that the law became something bad? In what sense? Hmm? It condemns. Sir? It's the veil. It builds pride. Self-righteousness. Yes. Huh? It's the letter that kills. Juxtaposed to the spirit that gives life. Yes. Anybody else? It was their form of righteousness. Okay, but let's focus on the more egregious ones. It, it kills. I like that. It brings pride, what Paul calls the boast in the law. So these are sins. These are not minor things. Okay. It gives us a boast in the flesh. Huh? It's the basis of condemnation. Basis of condemnation. Okay. In Colossians, what does he say? How does he show us that Satan was disarmed? Satan's our assailant, right? He's our accuser. He's Satan, accuser of the brethren. But he's got a weapon. And how, what does it show us in Colossians 2 was his weapon? And how was he disarmed? The law was nailed to the cross. And he disarmed principalities thus. Which is to say that principalities had picked up the law as a weapon against God's purpose and against God's people. It had become a tool in the hand of the enemy. 
And at the cross, it was nailed to the cross and the devil lost his army. He lost his armor, excuse me. He lost his weapons. Does that make sense? So in another sense, Jesus was crucified by the law. It was the law that put him to death. Isn't that what Caiaphas said? It is fitting according to our law that one should die for the sins of the many. Amen. Can the law justify us? No. By the works of the law, no man is justified. Okay, so it had a purpose. It served that purpose. And what is the seminal transition from the old covenant to the new covenant? Well, we are told in Jeremiah that the, old, the new covenant won't be like the old. How is it going to be different? Internalization. Can everybody say internalization? internalization? God never wanted it outside of us. He wanted it inside of us. Keeping it outside of us was never his goal. It was just an, a necessary element. And, and was the law ever an expression of his essence? The law in the sense of the Levitical system? Absolutely not. Notice how... Paul and Stephen both go out of their way to tell us that the law was instituted through angels. And they, they use terms that make us feel that it was an add-on. They say the, the law was added because of transgression. There were godly people before the law, Abraham, etc. There was a godly covenant before the law. There was the covenant of salvation before the law, Abraham. But it was an add-on. It was glued to the situation. It was like, why do I have to stay in my room today? Because you're really bad. And this isn't normal day life. This is an add-on to help you get better. I don't think they have that verse I just quoted, but the room verse. But it was an add-on and it was instituted through angels. Amen? So he's showing us that this was never the essence of God's heart. And the shift was a shift from external to internal. And what was the medium? The medium of the law was the flesh. What was the medium of the new covenant going to be? The Holy Spirit. I will give them a new spirit, says the Lord. Amen. They will all know me, he says in Jeremiah, from the least to the greatest. So he's going to restore relationship, which is what was lost in the garden. The garden is where they walk with God in the ruach of the day, in the spirit of the day. They lost that. It says when they sent, it says they sent him out of Eden, and that word is divorced. He divorced them from Eden. So there was a divorce that occurred when there was a separation, a covenant was broken. And the old covenant did not mend that brokenness, but the new covenant did. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. No more will each man say to his neighbor, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will wipe away their transgressions. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Does Paul connect the new covenant? There are many covenants, okay? There's the Edonic covenant, Eden. There's the Noahic covenant of rescue through, through the flood waters. There's the Abrahamic covenant. And there's the uh, Sinai covenant. Amen. Which covenant does Paul generally connect the new covenant to which spiritual covenant lineage does he attach to? Abraham. He does not attach to Sinai. He treats it as a temporary provision and add-on that served God's purpose for a limited time. But he taps back in to the faith of Abraham, this progressive journey of unfolding obedience in a trusting relationship that we call salvation. Hallelujah. So we don't, he never connected. He never connected to, to the Sinai covenant. He connected to the Abrahamic covenant. And, and what makes us heirs of the Abrahamic covenant? How do we explicitly connect to the promises of the Abrahamic covenant? Walk in the steps. That's the means. What makes us heirs? Let me put it that way. Let, what makes us heirs eligible to inherit the promises made to Abraham? That's it. He says in, in Romans 9 and also Galatians 3, three times, he says that Abraham 
that Jesus, that there, Abraham only had one seed. So it's not referring to many as to seeds, but to one, that is Isaac, because he says, the Lord said, at this time I will return and Sarah will have a son. And Paul is showing that it was the Lord's return that was cause for this miraculous birth. Do you understand? So he says that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. But then he says in this passage that he just quotes from Galatians 3, that if we are baptized into Christ and have clothed ourselves with Christ, he says we have put on Christ and we, plural, are Abraham's seed, singular. So through the Holy Spirit, through the baptism of the Spirit, that's how we become heirs of the promises that were made to Abraham. That's how we become heirs of the covenants of salvation. We're told in Hebrews that these all died in faith, not having received what was promised. And what was promised? Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power. And Peter, this is what was spoken of by the prophets. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit. This promise is for you and for your children. And Paul, as many as are born of promise, these are counted as sons. Do you see it? All the Old Testament believers died in faith, not having received the Holy Spirit, not having received what was promised. But they moved toward it. They moved us toward it. And they are made perfect as we step into that promise. We carry their faith with us. Had Jesus not come, there would have been no salvation. For Abraham, Moses, it was a settled matter in the mind of God. So that's silly to even state, but it's true. But conversely, had they not come, there would have been no New Testament. There would have been no salvation of the gospel. Paul says the gospel was the fulfillment of the promise spoken of by the prophets. He says this in Acts. Amen? So we can't attach to the shadow when the substance is here. We can't get enamored with the externals when the essence, the power, the reality is here. Jesus is the real thing. And this is what Paul is saying in Galatians when he says that throughout history, the, the people of God have been splitting based on those who want to stick in the flesh versus those who want to step out in the spirit and in the faith. Amen? So in Galatians, he says that Mount Sinai, notice he does not say the Midrash, as some dishonest translators today would have us believe. He says Mount Sinai corresponds today to Arabia and she is enslaved with her children. <laughs> so what he's saying is that Sarah became Hagar. Explicitly is what he says. Sarah became Hagar because Sarah refused to walk in faith. Those who, can, who, who try to sink back into what they can do in their flesh apart from the power of God those become Hagar. Those become slaves. That's what the law is. It's, it's a bondage. But those who can receive the Spirit, amen, they are the children of promise. They are the, the heirs according to promise. Amen. They are the ones for whom the, the covenants of Abraham were made. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. How, what did Jesus get in trouble for more than anything else? Perceived Sabbath violations. I want to just give you something to chew on because I can't end without giving this piece of fruit leather for whoever wants to tug on it. Um, <clears throat> when Jesus comes into the synagogue in Mark 3, he's about to get in trouble for working on the Sabbath. Okay? And <clears throat> he says to them, but he kind of upends the whole equation, right? says that he sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were on him because a man came in with a withered arm. And the eyes of all the synagogue were on him. And he says to them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? To grant life or to kill? Would you agree that that is not the equation they had in their heads? 
they wanted to, the equation to go like this. Is it lawful to do on the Sabbath or not to do? But he said, no. Is it lawful to do good or to do evil? In action, when God is present to work, is a work itself. It's a work of sin and rebellion. True Sabbath is not a seventh day observance. According to Hebrews 4, true Sabbath is ceasing from our works. Stopping doing what we can do in ourselves. And therefore it is entering into the works prepared beforehand from the foundation of the world that we should walk in. What typified Jesus' ministry more than anything else? That he did not do his own will, his own word, his own works, but he did only what the Father had told him. He was a living, breathing Sabbath everywhere he went. Do you understand? The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He typified a human being moving solely under the power and grace of God. As Brother Dan pointed out in our broadcast recently, It says, Jesus says in one of these disputes, my father is always working (coughs) until now. Amen. And so I am working his works. The question, Sabbath was not to cease God's works. It's to cease human works. But when God is prompting us to do something, the only way to cease from our works is to do it. And to refuse to do what God is prompting is to work and break the Sabbath. He asked them, is it lawful to do evil? So he's accusing them of breaking the Sabbath. You get that? And then he's accusing them of killing on the Sabbath because they're refusing to enter into what God is prompting, which is to give life. This illuminates what Sabbath is all about. Stop doing what you can do in the flesh and move by the power of the Spirit. This Sabbath dynamic is is realized in Paul's statement, by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. How does he prove that? Because I worked harder than you all. Who is a Sabbath breaker? No, no, no. But it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Amen. Amen. This is what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 10 when he says, when you're brought before rulers, don't worry about what you're going to say for it won't be you speaking, but it will be my father speaking through you what you should say. All those years, that seventh day was an arrow pointing and saying, someday you're going to be able to give your whole life and you're not just going to sit in quiet isolation but you're going to give your whole life over to the one who made you and he's going to work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. One day there's going to be a people upon the earth who live the Sabbath that Jesus lived in every day where we say, the words that I speak are not my own and the works that I do are not my own, but the Father who is always working, he does the work. That's even better than fruit leather. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let me wrap it up. It's not a coincidence that he got in trouble for for performing miracles on the Sabbath. He was getting in trouble for, for performing the highest level of Sabbath man had ever known. The shadow was beating up on the reality. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody still with me? Can you, can you uh, bear with me for a conclusion? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you praise. We thank you, God, for what you've done. We thank you for what you've called us to. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The arrows of the past Levitical system and the shadows can easily become the bronze serpent that was commanded by God, but turned into an idol. And that is why in Isaiah 66, the Lord says, this is what the Lord says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? 
Has not my hands made all these things? And he begins to go and he says, you who sacrifice a bull are like one who kill a person. And he goes through all the sacrifices that he commanded. And he says, it's an abomination to me because you're doing it your way. Amen? So true Sabbath is to cease from our way and to enter into God's way. Thank you, Jesus. Returning to Jewish roots is going to bring about life from the dead, we said at the first. Amen. Why? Because the nature of our current problem is atomization. Not with a D, with a T. Atomization. Analytical knowledge translates into atomized congregations, atomized people, an atomized kingdom, which is no kingdom at all. Amen? So to remove ourselves from this atomization entails recognizing that to become a Christian and to take our place in the kingdom of God means being grafted into the covenants of promise and becoming part of the commonwealth of Israel. Israel did not envision salvation as an individualistic thing. So to get back to our roots, we need to get rid of this individualism. It's garbage. That's a theological term coming from the Greek word garbos. Oh, no. Never. I bet I could have gotten away with that. Except my brothers would have laughed too loud. We got to get back to the root. We know that circumcision was the covenant was the cutting of the covenant in the first covenant. But he says, whoever has broken this covenant, whoever is not circumcised has broken my covenant. And what's the result? He will be put out from his people. The people of God was the place of salvation. We got to get back to a corporate identity. Paul says that Christ died for the church and gave himself for her. Isaiah says that the bride is married to God. But her sons have got to be in a marriage covenant with her. That's the church. We've got to get rid of this individualism and get back to the root of salvation as a community, as a salvation as a kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. This is one of our big roots. Amen? We've got to get back to that relational understanding of who he is, that salvation belongs to the Jews because of their view of God. We've got to get away from the, the stodgy, dead worship. Why can we tolerate this Greek worship? Why can we tolerate it? Because we've exalted the mind instead of the God. We've exalted what we can know with our analysis instead of what we can experience viscerally in His presence. But God is wanting to restore the tabernacle of David in these times. Restore an atmosphere of worship, of ecstatic praise, of unity, of power in the, in the praise of, of, of the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what the Jewish roots are going to signify. To Israel belongs the adoption, Paul says. This is Paul. To Israel belongs the adoption as sons. Theirs is the divine glory and the covenants. Theirs is the giving of the law and the temple worship and the promises. That's what we've got to be grafted back into. Not some radical individualism. The thing that runs most counter to the kingdom we talked about in the beginning is the individualism that has turned the covenant into a status instead of a unity with a people. Amen. We've got to get unmixed. We've got to come out of Babylon. We've got to come out of these hybrids and come into that people. Do you picture it? Do you see it? Do you see communities all over the face of the earth where people's education comes into alignment with the Word of God? Where people's vocation starts to become laborari es harari, such labor is worship. Amen. Where people's relationship with the world is one of ambassadors from another kingdom. 
where we can honestly declare in Christ we are complete. That means we don't need the world. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. You know, that's scary to be complete in Christ. That's what they were experiencing when they left Egypt. We want to be completed by the leeks and garlics. We want to be completed by the safety, at least the predictability. They long to go back to Egypt, back to bondage. And some, it's terrifying to contemplate coming out into a place of total responsibility. Can I trust my brothers like that? Well, not unless they come to a deeper level of repentance. Can I trust God's leading like that? Not unless the Holy Spirit becomes the olive branch of fresh anointing. How can I possibly do that? What will the world think of me? Well, if you seek the praises of men, you cannot accept the praises of God. Amen. But there is a promise that remains. We are in the time when the Jewish perspective is coming back into the church. Amen. And something, life is starting to show up on some old dead pieces of wood. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm, Thank you, Jesus. Don't you want to be part of that kingdom? Amen. Amen. And so the call is to us to get back to our Jewish roots. And the call is to the Jewish people that now the full number of the Gentiles has come in. It's time to start turning and realizing our unity again with the Abrahamic root that supports us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.